Coming up on a Friday edition of OGP, movement on the roster, Keelan Doss in, TJ Brunson out. We take a look at those position groups and discuss what, if anything, we can read in the tea leaves going forward. Brian Dable continues to ingratiate himself to the organization and the players with the final day off from mandatory minicamp. A little getaway day on a Friday, breaking it all down right after the theme music. Oh, yes, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where, as always, I am your host, Adam Armbrecht, also breaking down the Brooklyn Nets over on the Locked On Nets podcast with my boy, Doug Nori. No, Andy Makowitz here. He seemed to get the wrong impression around Brian Dable giving the team off and holding a picnic at the facility. Maybe we'll get some social media posts, him laying down there, blankets spread out, a little bit of brie, I'm sure some wine coolers going there for Mr. Makowitz. So he took the day off. Listen, it is what it is. The season generational ticket holder will be back with us on Monday. But in the meantime, we didn't know, or at least I didn't know, I should say, what to anticipate once we heard that Brian Dable was going to go ahead and give the back end of this mandatory mini camp a little bit of, little bit of reprieve here for the players. Hold a facility-wide organizational picnic there at the team facility. It's a great way, right? We talk about the positivities of turning over uh, not just some of the roster, but also obviously at the head coach and at the GM level. Why not build up a little bit of that goodwill amongst the team and continue? It's a, Everything is positive right now. So you had some good workouts. You got in some great reps. You saw some good things from some players. And you go ahead and you let everybody take a little bit of a relaxation here at the end of the week, knowing that it'll be uh, July 19th will be when the rookies will get back into the facility here now. And then seven days later, we'll get all the veterans and the rest of the team in there for training camp. So there's the gap, right? A month off here. And as Andy mentioned in the last episode, it'll be interesting to see what we hear. There'll still be news and notes. Um, what happens behind the scenes? What do we hear about players that are working out, getting together, trying to continue to work on their craft? So we'll keep an eye on that, obviously. But when wondering then, with no more minicamp reps to talk about, what do we do next? Certainly, we get a little bit of news here around the roster. Uh, one player going out, one player coming in. We had mentioned Keelan Doss was there trying out with the team, was with the team for two days. Indications were that they would sign him. They have signed him. But before we get to Keelan Doss and what his impact could be potentially, at least over the course of training camp, let's talk about the player that goes out the door, and that is one TJ Brunson. Uh, not Mr. Irrelevant, as I had noted on a previous episode, uh, but out of the linebacking core, obviously a player missed last season with the ACL coming into his fourth year now, pulled over from a previous regime. Not all that surprising. We talk about the money side of it here first as well, because uh, obviously if you're going to hold over anybody else from camp and there's other moves to be made here, Giants were around $6 million in cap room, but in releasing TJ Brunson, they're going to go ahead on the post June one end up eating about just $20,000 in dead cap while freeing up nearly $900,000 in cap relief. And again, it's not just one-to-one. -one. Now you have that money. You're There's going to be tons of moves that'll probably happen in the off season here, but at least in the short term, you open up that possibility uh, for maybe some additional moves to get made here as other teams start to cut and release players around the league, potentially between whether it's now in the immediate over the next handful of days, week or so, or going in towards training camp and seeing some opportunities to bring in some other talent. Um, you know, there's nothing much to say here. A lot of these players, when we talk about holdover guys like Brunson, just you're not safe, right? You can't come into this camp thinking that it's automatic. We talk about Tay Crowder and, and what we think his role is going to be. Will he be capable of, of keeping that starting position next to Blatina? How soon do we want to see the younger players, one of the draft pick from this year in McFadden and Darian Beavers starting to get some reps there, right? Looking at a Carter Coughlin, who I quietly give a little fist pump when I hear that Brunson goes because everybody is on is on the block here, so to speak, and it doesn't mean that anyone else is any more safe right now. But but I start to mention those names there. It's interesting because I'm including the edge rushers in this as well. As we know, some of these guys with versatility are going to see a lot of different schemes and lineups here underneath Wink Martindale. 
But when you think about having Thibodeau, Crowder, Martinez, and Ojolari, let's just label it that way in the first wave there. In behind them with Roche, Carter, McFadden, and Eximenez, asterisk next to him's name potentially, I think. And then you get Cam Brown, Hilliard, Ellerson Smith, Darian Beavers, and then obviously Fox there as well. You already find yourself with, what is it, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 players in that linebacker edge group there. It's a large chunk, right, to be carrying on the roster right now. In the grand scheme of things, as we had as we had previously discussed about how Ellerson Smith was starting to flash, this is where I think you look at a guy at O'Shane Eximenez. We've talked about it. We'll get we'll get into the money here at the back end of this episode, as far as why some of these guys could be labeled uh, as potential cuts and why you can shuffle up the board. Just resetting it a little bit before we get away here, um, and we'll be back in next week. We're going to do some more expansive conversations around the Giants. Uh, maybe have a little bit of fun with some favorites around the position groups, et cetera, not just this year, but at all time for the New York football giants. We want to get you guys in on that as well. Um, but, but that group is, you know, there's a lot of youth there. There's a lot of possibilities there with a handful of these players. And so as much as possible, I think the giants would like to continue to flesh them out. But again, as we've said several times over the course of this off season, availability, right? Consistency. That's what this new regime has talked so much about. And there's still a lot of guys wearing red jerseys, but TJ Brunson off the ACL going to be hard to see his path forward. And in fact, we will not see his path forward. So he gets released. That's the deal there. The other side of it then is the Keelan Doss signing. Now, I don't know the, we don't have the financial details just yet on it, but we'll see what that looks like. If there's guaranteed dollars, we talked about that with some of the rookies and the undrafted uh, free agent class this year. But I do find him interesting. Um, now, again, let's not overstate it. Keelan Doss has 11 career receptions, right? Uh, came out of UC Davis. He started with a practice squad for the Jaguars, then caught on with the Raiders after they released Antonio Brown. And he got in a handful of games there, caught 11 of 14 passes. That's his career at the NFL level at this point. But if we want to take a look again inside the position group, and this is where we'll, again, we're always going to talk a little bit about the money there. And we said it before, what do we have? What are the expectations for a guy like, um, like Darius Slayton, excuse me, because right now, even though we have Kenny Galladay in a red Jersey and quick aside here, we'll get back to Keelan Dawson in a minute. We, we've been, we've been, you know, heavy handed on uh, Kenny Galladay. We believe that he can have a role. I don't know if we talked about this on or off podcast, but I actually did the math here. I know we did it with, with Bellinger around what the expectations would be. Well, I think I did this with pessimistic Mike. When you look at Kenny Galladay and you think about just the offense overall, 500 plus passing attempts you anticipate this year for Daniel Jones and how is it going to spread around assuming health, you know, Kadarius Tony is going to be deserving of 125 to 150 targets. You know, you're going to be using Saquon with 90 receptions his rookie year out of the backfield. When we came down to it, we said, you know, if you end up in something like a five to seven range per game in terms of targets for Kenny Galladay, even at five, right? You can end up thinking about him being someone who's catching 50 to 60 balls, right? You know, giving you consistency, giving you reliability, still being able to use that big frame, obviously, in the red zone a bit. So it was fascinating. And I, and I only say that because watching some of the footage of him in individual workouts, like he looks, you know, he looks good. Everybody looks good in t-shirt and shorts. Um, but, but I, I hope the best for him. And I, I think we said this before about several players. We said it about Tate Crowder, said it about Julian Love. Like we're not a podcast that doesn't want these players to succeed, whether they're making, whether they represent 20% of the entire cap or they represent half a percent, right? Whether they're in their final year of the rookie contract or in the second year of a multi-year big dollar deal. We want everyone to be successful. It's just, you have to temper expectations around this at least to a certain extent. That being the case, though, when we talk about this wide receiver group now, I think, you know, we still have the question mark around Sterling Shepard. When, if healthy, will he be able to get back on the field officially for the Giants when you look towards even the regular season? Training camp could tell us a lot there as well. But Kadarius Tony, Kenny Galladay, Sterling Shepard, Wandell Robinson. I mean, those four guys, and really just the three, taking Shepard at least partially off the table, are the real guarantees you have here. And then you bring in everybody else, and we're interested to see how things play out. The one thing that I will say when you hear Keelan Doss get signed, guy that comes in, that tries out, team likes him. They want to give him a look, six foot three, 215, right? And we'll get into a little bit of details around his game, which I think are noteworthy. 
But the first thing that it tells me is, you know, they retain CJ board. He has special teams value. But when you think about guys like Colin Johnson, like David Sills, uh, like Bachman, you have to now add into along with Richie James, who looked pretty good over the course of this summer so far and Robert Foster. Now Keelan Doss, like you're at, you're hearing new names now, right? So when we're discussing back end of the roster guys and filling out a position group, you do have to have some level of awareness of, right? Look inside that group and say, well, we got 15 guys, you know, 16 players at this position. They're not all coming with us. And there's going to be this cutoff. TJ Brunson, injury, lack of production, back end draft guy, fine. These other players, practice squad, right? Fringe roster players. Somebody's going to go here. The interesting thing would be, is if the signing of Keelan Doss and how things look in training camp next month could potentially impact how they look at a Darius Slayton, the 2.5 million that he has on the books that they can get out from underneath or anybody else in here as well. Cause the one thing I don't know if we, if we made a note of this last time, but when we look through this roster real quick here, it's noteworthy that on the post June one cut, which is where we'd be sitting here now, I wanted to just get a quick look. You know, Sterling Shepard's not going to be a candidate for this uh, with the way the, the dead money works uh, on him. And I think you want to give him every chance to have success. But I was really looking more down the list here a little bit uh, at the wide receiver group. And just curiously, you know, Richie James doesn't have a lot on the books there uh, for himself. 100 in dead cap, almost a million you could free up. Not saying that they'd be considering that, but he is no more guaranteed than anything else. But I wanted to get to CJ Board, who has zero dead cap hit and $990,000 in cap relief. I think bringing him back is good, but you see the flexibility there as you have an opportunity to bring in other players to try out, and then you grab them onto the roster. Well, it's interesting to see if there's any dead cap number associated with Keelan Doss contract. Quite frankly, Robert Foster, who I've spoken highly of and was interested to see what he could do. He also has a zero dead cap hit, right? So those two receivers right there are already earmarked potentially for nearly $2 million in cap relief that isn't going to cost you anything. And the point being is that you know, Colin Johnson, another guy at 900000 with no dead cap number. So this wide receiver group and these back-end guys, these special team contributors, it's all up in the air right now. Anybody can come out of the backside of that. And Keelan Doss, just to give you the rundown on him quickly, and I went back, you got to go back to um, you know, coming out as a prospect, obviously he's 26 years old now. Um, but what he brings to the table is crisp route running. He has a high football IQ and positional versatility, which I think is important to note here Can line up at the X, Y, or Z, uh, in formations. And again, when we come back to, uh, I will say, uh, we, we mentioned this the other day about, you know, resetting expectations around Darius Slayton, fifth round pick. Obviously, you don't want to set a, buy too, a bar too high for him. Likewise, don't set a bar too high for Keelan Doss. But Darius Slayton's positional limitations, at least as, as far as we know him right now, maybe he'll show something in camp, right? We, they, you heard mentioned, even at one point, Darius Slayton was lined up in the backfield. So I'm sure that this new offensive scheme is saying, hey, let's see how everyone can work at every possible uh, position here within the scheme. And if you show production, if you show value, then that's an opportunity for us to have success. But the fact that Darius Slayton has 2.5 on the books and maybe is also somewhat limited in the versatility and how you can say, hey, we're going to have Kenny Galladay and Kadarius Tony and Wandell Robinson. Now we're going to drop in Darius Slayton, but we're going to use him out of the slot or we're going to line him up at position X or Y. We're going to go ahead and flip over and bring in a Richie James for more speed, right? We're going to take Kenny Galladay. And this is why Kenny Galladay still have hope and excitement for him because he obviously has been a quality at the highest level receiver in the NFL. And because you know that he can line up at different spots too. This isn't a straight guy on the outside, big body, go get it. He has versatility in that regard too. So that that's the, I think just the takeaway from signing and bringing a guy like Keelan Doss, give him the summer, see what happens. And ultimately, when we talk about the money coming into this uh, into this offseason and where things lie, we can reset the table there just a little bit. Um, when we scroll through here, as we mentioned, the TJ Brunson piece, that helps them out a little bit. Uh, while Tay Crowder, I think, is far closer to being a contributor and a part of this roster than not, he has a very low dead cap hit number, too. I, I don't anticipate that. More just guys that jump out off the page uh, at you when you work your way through. Ben Bredesen. 
jumps out off the page because he has 900,000, right? Kennedy, who was brought in this offseason to compete, also has a zero dead cap hit and 900,000, right? Gary Bright, someone we haven't been able to touch on too much so far this offseason, 45,000 in dead cap, almost 900,000 in cap relief. This is the way, just as we're thinking about working our way through the summer, we're going to see other cuts come. We're going to see other uh, players get brought in as cuts happen around the league. But there's a number of guys that you can roll through here when you think about that $6 million cap room number that the Giants have right now. You can move that up 7, 8, 9, 10, 12. Like you can get up that mark pretty quickly. Now, obviously, you anticipate maybe bringing in some players as well along the way, but there's just a laundry list of guys here. Um, Roche is not going to be one of those players. Hilliard could be one of those players with 825 coming off the books. Jaquette was brought in just this offseason. David Sills, likewise, over 800,000. Jaron Williams, don't know where he stacks up in this hierarchy of the secondary. He's got a nice free and clear money relief as well. So th there, there's a lot of things to think about um, just in terms of, of how this roster can evolve at a very quick pace. For the Giants this offseason and Brunson out Dawson Dawson is not is not breaking news cycles, but it, it does bring to mind when we look at this roster and we'll start to do a bit more of this as well. You know, a 53 man roster. We know the usual suspects that are going to be on this list, but I can tell you right now. That when you say names like Brightwell, CJ Board, Colin Johnson, Robert Foster. Um, maybe uh, Marinick at the tight end position, Bachman, Sills, right? Uh, Antonio Williams. When you talk about guys like Revis inside of the offensive line or Jamil Douglas or Cunningham, right? These are all names, all, all names that are going to be on the conversation to be like, oh, and most of those guys offensively, I think you look at and go, yeah, that's, that's all fine and well. The interesting thing defensively is when you say names like Nico Lalos or David Moa. Not that I'm talking about guys that you're overly excited about, but they've played NFL snaps. They can have a role as a backup on this team. They can be a rotational piece. Those guys are going to be in those discussions, though. You now have Holmes in there uh, at the defensive end position. Remember, Ryder, An Ryder Anderson was brought in. You have the Ellis's, Justin and Jabari. You have the rookie in DJ Davidson as well. Like something's going to happen there. Mentioned Hilliard before. And then when you get into the secondary again, this is why we spend a little bit of time talking about Julian Love here, just because you've got McKinney and Love, and you've also got Cordell Flott, and you've got Adoree Jackson. You've got Radarius Williams. You've got Thompson. You've got Black. You've got Holmes. You've got Belton. You've got Robinson. You've got Jaquette. You've got Evans. You've got Corker. You've got Williams. There's too many bodies in the secondary right now, right? That's going to have to thin out here a bit at some point. It'll be interesting to see how, how they go about that. Oh, we'll get out of here on one thing with Yusuf Corker. I, I thought I don't I know we've talked about him and, and highlighted liking what he brings to the table and obviously having potential to be a contributor. Just as a reminder, coming out of college, played at the safety position, also went down and played at the nickel in, in certain packages for the defense as well. He played in uh in punt return, he also played in coverage against kicks, he also was on the field goal special teams units for field goal blocks. Um, so there is a versatility to his game that automatically you can get excited about around making this roster. And I think for the most part, when we've talked about him, everyone seems to be excited about him making the 53 man roster. But if you're going to make that statement and let, and we're going to say that Julian love and Xavier McKinney, uh, along with a Jackson, Cordell Flott, and Darnay Holmes, Dane Belton, that's already six, Aaron Robinson, seven, right? So use of Corker eight, Eight members of the secondary right there to say nothing of Rodarius Williams, Jaquette, right? Darren Evans, uh, or also Jaron Williams, right? Henry Black is in the mix there. H how many are you going to carry in the secondary along the way? Some of the versatility certainly makes it possible to carry a few more bodies there, but then how do you thin out at the linebacking spot? And it's interesting to think about. We'll do a comparison early next week with Wink Martindale. How many bodies has he carried previously down in Baltimore at the linebacking core, at the defensive front, and then back there in the secondary? Because the more versatility you can identify, at least gives you the opportunity to say, yeah, and we mentioned this when Julian Love was being used as a linebacker, right? Hey, if the situation dictates, are we just as well off, whether it's run or pass, saying we have 
two deep safeties. We also have a safety with some speed and a little bit of strength in the box. And we have this flexibility on the outside with where Belton or Yusuf Corker or any of the deep secondary players along, obviously behind a Dory Jackson behind Aaron Robinson. We think, right. You, you want to go by ESPN. You can have Cordell Flott playing on the outside right now. Um, I think the bigger question is, can he line up immediately at the slot corner position day one here? And then that would create some depth. If Darnay Holmes now becomes a more versatile weapon, we made mention of him going back a couple of weeks and saying, go back and look at his measurables and, and try to get back into the tape and see where he had some success. If he can continue to develop, he's he's big enough, strong enough, and, and you think quick enough, especially in the hips, to be able to be inside, outside, depending on the sub packages that you want to run. So that being the case, we're running a tight ship here on a Friday. We hope everybody has a good weekend coming up here. It is the summer. Like I said, we're going to get a little more expansive. Andy and I will lock down where we think the 53-man roster will go when we come back around for training camp. Who do we think is going to be the next wave of cuts? And then one thing um, that I will give you the tease on that we talked about, and I, I apologize because the allergies are, if you're watching on YouTube, are, are they're giving me they're giving me issues here. Um, the prove it, the prove it. So it was so exciting, I could barely even barely even keep my voice steady. Um, the prove it scale for the New York Football Giants roster. Taking a look at all of the key names, some of them are the superstar talents, some of them are back end roster guys. What are the tiers of players that need to come into this season and absolutely lock it up and show you what their value is to not only help the team have success in the short term, but to give them long term stability on the New York Football Giants roster? There's a lot of really interesting names that we're going to break that down probably over multiple episodes. So be sure to come back for that. You get the podcast if you get those needs fulfilled. We obviously always appreciate the conversations. We chopped it up. Um, what is it? Beefarino? <laughs> I don't think that's the exact name. You know who you are. We appreciate in the comments. We were chopping it up over Daniel Jones, interception percentage versus Josh Allen. And we obviously make comparisons around what you want the expectations to be for him, what's good, bad, and different when it comes to fumbles and turnovers and INTs, all the good stuff, man. We love the conversation. So hopefully when we have those back and forth, you always take it the same way that we're giving it out as a fun conversation, having a good debate, because that's what we want this to be for OGP and anyone that's checking us out. We want to engage with you. This isn't, this isn't contentious. We're not going to draw lines in the sand, but we are going to have a lot of fun batting around what could be possible for the New York football giants. So you get us on YouTube, you get us on the podcast feed, you enjoy your weekend as, as Andy Makowitz would want, need, and nay, always demand the people know, hey, let's go Big Blue.